Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 147, Dealing with Failure. I'm your host, Madison Whalen, and my co-host, Joseph Whalen. Hello, Maddie. How you doing today? I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm doing okay. How are things been? We've been off. Took an extra week off last week. Uh, Band started up again, marching band. Yep. So your schedule's filling up. We had to shuffle our recording days around a little bit. So we're recording on Thursdays now. Yep. And the schedule is just going to get more hectic as the months roll on, right? That's all right. It's something to do, right? Anything exciting happened in that time? Um, one of my friends um, is probably is uh, in marching band now. One oh. of my younger friends. So. Well, there you go. See? I'll be hanging out with her more. That's cool. All good stuff. Yeah. So what are you talking about today? Today we're talking about dealing with failure. Popular culture has left us with the idea that failure is not an option. While no one likes to fail, the reality of the situation is failure happens. On this episode of Insights into Teens, we're going to talk about what failure is and how to turn failures into positive and constructive experiences. There's the first fumble for the day. There you go. Let's get that out of the way right up front. Let's get the fumbles out of the way. All right. Shall we get started? Oh, wait. We got some business to do before we get started. I know. Ugh. But before we get started, <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't hosted in Here, a while. Here, let me prompt you. Here, this might help. Um, uh, Line, please. Okay. Um, so, hang on. Uh, before we get started, we'd like you to subscribe to our podcast. You can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast service. Uh, you can also... Email us at comments at insightsintothings.com or on Twitter at twitter.com slash insightsintothing underscore things. Um, we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insightsintothings podcast. Something. <laughs> uh, we're on Instagram at instagram.com slash insightsintothings. Or you can get everything and more on our official website at w- www.insightsintothings.com That's a lot of W's there, man. <laughs> it's only three. I'm all sorry. Right, we stumbled through all that. Are you ready? Uh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> so what is failure? And this research comes to us from betterup.com. So a fairly common understanding of failure is setting a goal but not achieving it. We tend to believe that knowing whether or not you achieve a goal is fairly simple and straightforward. It's often based on data. But in truth, failure is often in the eye of the beholder. Imagine yourself in these three scenarios and whether you'd consider yourself to have failed. An experienced marathon runner sets a goal to run her next marathon in under four and a half hours. This goal is a full 15 minutes shorter than her prior best time. She completes the marathon in 4 hours and 36 minutes, besting her prior prior record by 9 minutes. Failure or success? Well, I don't know. Coming from someone like me, just, like, doing a marathon is a monumental success. Walking a marathon in 4 days for me would be a, a monumental success. But that's one of these that's one of those situations where you certainly did better, but you didn't hit your goal. So 
maybe it's not a hundred percent success. Yeah. But it's more success than what you had met been met with before. Yeah, you were able to not only reach your previous time, but overcome it slightly. Right. And it's a progressive type thing. Yeah, and technically thinking about it, you only you didn't finish you only finished six more minutes ahead of your original goal. Right. So you improved. You improved. And that's the important thing. Yeah. What's our next scenario? A senior director seeks a promotion to VIP and competes against other internal and external candidates. She receives positive feedback, but she gets told that the leadership team felt that hiring an external person would demonstrate their commitment to charge, failure, or success. Well, and this is a good one here. So in this case, what you wanted to achieve was a total failure because you wanted that position of VP. But you got praise. But what's praise going to do in that situation? Just put salt in the wound. Right. It's like, oh, you you do a really good job, but it doesn't matter because we want to promote a certain image of change. So we're going to bring somebody in from the outside. So in that case... Is it a failure because you didn't fail to get the job because you weren't qualified or there weren't the right person? The criteria prevented you from getting the job. Yeah. So in that case, failure was the only option because they weren't going to let you have that job no matter what. Yeah. So there's still a sense of failure, although there was nothing you could have done to differently to change the outcome. Yeah. And what's our last one? Our last one is... A top young professional at an organization gets asked to prepare a a slide deck for a high-profile meeting. He submits what he considers to be an excellent presentation to his boss. The boss praises the work, but substantially changes the slides before the big meeting. Failure or success? And this is another good one. So in this case here, you did everything that was asked of you. The boss changed what the presentation looked like. But I don't know if that necessarily means it's a failure in your part. Yeah. Because the boss could be going for a certain type of presentation, a certain style. He could be going for a certain type of reaction from the audience. He might know the audience better than you do. And him asking you to to prepare the slides was because you knew the material better than he did. Yeah. So if he's presenting the same information but in a different way... I would say that's probably a success, not a failure. Yeah. So it's let's finish up here, and then I can I can go on. So notice that the differentiator, differentiator, differentiator in all three of these failure analysis examples is an ideal we've set in our minds. Measuring goal achievement can be a subjective and political activity, and in each of these examples above, you can you can sense that the individuals tried hard and performed well in their efforts. Perhaps that common definition of being in failure mode as not achieving a goal isn't so accurate and straightforward after all. Yeah, I think that the important takeaway here is that success is not necessarily goal-oriented because there are circumstances that determine how much you can succeed. Success isn't black and white. It's not yes or no in a lot of cases. Yeah. In, in many cases, success is a measure of achievement, not a measure of success. Yeah. And I think the three examples they give you here are really talking, kind of hitting the point on that where even though you don't, like, let's put it in terms of a, a, a high school, okay? So you may have a tough test coming up on a subject that you're struggling with. And you may be getting a B in in that class right now. And you study and study and study with the hope of getting 100 on that test, which would far exceed where your current grades are. Where you take the test, and you do pretty good on it, but you don't get 100, you get a 95 on it. Well, just because you didn't get 100 doesn't mean you failed. You've gotten far better than you've gotten on the previous tests. So, again, it's that measure of how much you've succeeded. It's not a a switch that you flip on and off. Yeah. Do you have situations like that where your your measure of success 
comes in degrees or usually do you find that your success or failures are you know do or die where if you don't if you don't complete something then it's it's a hundred percent failure well yeah i will say that um i actually had a specific scenario today um based on my presentation i was supposed to be doing in engineering basically it was about the product the product life cycle of, in our case, a shoe. And basically, we were the last group to go up, and everyone else um, did their presentations, and pretty much everyone had certain aspects of the process that our group didn't, and I thought that we didn't get all of it. We're not going to do well on it. It's gonna, we're, it's just going to fail, and we're going to get a lower grade for it, and it's just going to be awful. Um, so, basically, it was like one or two slides about like the manufacturing process and just the material processing. And basically, we didn't include those. We kind of just included what we thought our teacher wanted, and it kind of made me think, oh my god, we've completely failed at this, we were supposed to do all of it, and we didn't. And how did the teacher treat it? Well, um, we still did our regular presentation. Um, other people thought it was pretty well when I asked them, and I'm pretty sure the teacher was fine with it, because there was another group that didn't really do that either. Um, so... I don't think he thought of it as a big deal entirely. See, and that's the important thing, because a lot of times it's not just about whether or not you execute on what the ultimate outcome is. It's how you get there. And I've run into this a lot at work with my staff, where I'll, I'll task them to do something. And yes, the ultimate goal might be to upgrade a mail server, for instance. Well, doing that and then having all the prep work ahead of time. So, for instance, we're going through a, a similar situation now where we're, we're moving to a newer version of our mail server. And it was budgeted for two days of work to get done. And we had reached out. We're, we're engaging with an, an outside vendor in this case here. And we engaged with them weeks ahead of time to try to line everything up. One of the things that I do is I, I have a tendency of planning things to the nth degree and I like to have all my stuff planned out and ready to go and I like to have backup plans in place because nothing ever goes like you plan it in plan A so I've got plan B, C, D and E usually and I had reached out to this vendor probably three times and asked them hey can you guys jump into our system give it a once over make sure all the assumptions that you've made so far are accurate so that we're going to have a smooth transition well, that started last week. So our two-day project is now finishing up its second week, and it's not done yet. And it's because as soon as these guys decided to start working, they started running into problems. And they're all problems that could have been found ahead of time if they had gotten in the system like I had asked them to. You know, licensing issues and drive storage and all kinds of simple things that are maintenance things that had to have been cleaned up after they started. So ultimately, the end goal is going to be achieved. You know, we're going to get this upgrade done, but the project, in my opinion, at least as far as this vendor is concerned, is going to be a failure because it was budgeted for two days. It's taken more than two weeks. You've inconvenienced my staff. You've inconvenienced my users. And I still don't have the project done. So in that case, it's not about getting the job done. It's about how you got that job done. Yeah. And now, you know, we can walk away from this after this. And there's lessons to be learned from that. Okay. So the next time we engage, first of all, do we engage with this vendor again? Do I give them a second chance at the next project? If we do... Do I insist that they get in there ahead of time? Do we check all these things ourselves ahead of time? And can, like, We'll do an after-action analysis of this and figure out what went wrong, where it went wrong, and whose fault it was. And you do that not to point the finger at people. You do that so that this failure isn't a failure entirely. You do that so that you can learn lessons from it. Yeah. So based on that... 
it's kind of important that we redefine failure. You know, failure isn't always a yes or no. Did it get done? Didn't it get done? And you can reframe that by using different synonyms. And they talk in the research about several of these synonyms and how they apply. So the first they talk about is novice. So when you're new at something, success is less likely. Just as you can't set an expectation for a child to tie their shoes perfectly the first time or even the tenth time, you can't avoid, you, you can't hold yourself to the standard of the expert when you're a novice. So you kind of have to put things into perspective. Yeah. If it's the first time you're doing this to sort of upgrade, you have to expect issues. Yeah. When you try something new, take a beginner's mindset. Remind yourself that you're a novice and give yourself chances to improve. That leads into a learning opportunity. Fear of failure is one of the strongest inhibitors of learning. We fail at 100% of the things we never try. And we have a chance to learn at 100% of the things we fail at. So even if you fail at something, it doesn't have to be a negative if you can learn something from it. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we've said on this podcast numerous times is that we learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. That's what makes them worthwhile. Yep. The next, and we've addressed this on the podcast before, is perfectionism. If you have a strong perfectionist streak, you may label things as failures that really aren't. For example, you may make a mistake during a presentation at a high-level meeting with the top organizational leaders. Despite excellent feedback from all in attendance, you fixate on that one moment that didn't go exactly as planned. When you're beating yourself up for past failure, ask yourself, have I actually failed? And I think a lot of times the things that you tend to beat yourself up on, you do it ahead of time a lot of times. You, you work yourself up with these expectations of perfectionism. But when you take on those challenges, you more often than not succeed in them. And I think the thing that frustrates me is when I watch this is that the more you succeed at these things that you psych yourself out of, the more confident you should get. And that confidence tends to be not as forthcoming as I'd like it to seeing you. True. What else do we have? There's also systematic bias. Such biases are practices or beliefs embedded within a system that disadvantage different groups. In the modern workplace, systematic bias persists against people of color. They also persist against women, people with disabilities, and the LGBTQ plus community. For many of them, it can be the root cause of their perceived failure. There's also ambiguity. Our worlds are increasingly am amb ambiguous, ambiguous and unpredictable. Who could have anticipated a global pandemic would break roots in 2019, upend the world of work almost overnight? Avoiding failure is nearly impossible in some environments, particularly those that are high, highly volatile, uncertain, complex, or ambiguous. When ambiguity is decreasing, the likelihood of a goal achievement, adjust goal targets, or pivot the business. There's also trial and error. A core principle of design thinking is the idea of, fa of failing fast and learning from failure. This mindset embraces failure as a natural part of the creative process. Trial and error provide the opportunity to continuously make things better. This is a concept that is um, it's a philosophy that's embraced a lot in the tech world. And you'll hear people... You know, Facebook has this philosophy and Google, and it's fail fast. So get out there with whatever this great idea is, put it out there, and if it fails, let's fail quickly so we can correct it and move on. And we run into this, you know, in the development world too. When we prototype, we come up with a new idea that we want to put out there for our users, and the first thing we usually wind up doing is we we theorize what we want to do, what the function is going to be, and we figure out what 
what the pain points are that people have, and then we'll build a proof of concept. And what that lets us do is put that functionality out there in a limited fashion without investing too much development time. And you let people take a look at it. And people are going to go out there, they're going to poke around, they're going to click on stuff, and they're going to play with it. And if it falls flat on its face, that's great. That's exactly the time that you want that to happen. Because that's where you can correct things without it being too costly. If those failures happen after you go to production with stuff, then it becomes very expensive. We talk about from an engineering standpoint. You know, you're in an engineering course right now. What happens when you get out in the working world and maybe you're an architect for a construction firm and your job's to build a building? Well, you want those failures to happen on the first floor because when they happen on the first floor, they're less costly, they're less dangerous, you're less likely to get people hurt than if they happen when the building's at the 30th floor and problems start arising. That's why they say fail quickly. What else do we have? We also have renewed motivation. Sometimes a small failure becomes the setback that sparks a renowned complement to a goal or project. You may have subconsciously put the goal on autopilot or become distracted by other priorities. And finally, there's being simply unfinished. The basic idea? Something that looks failed or broken may only be a misrepresentation of an unfinished process. Step back and look at the longer-term trajectory before declaring something failed. Now, this is a great one for anyone who does personal projects. Um, writing a story. Making a movie. Um, let's take your, your movie that you were making that was an animated movie that you were doing. Stop-motion animation. Did you ever finish it? No. But that doesn't make it a failure. Because how much have you learned of the creative process in going through and doing all that stuff? A lot. A lot of, you know, characterization, plot points, and I've honestly changed the story a decent amount. Exactly. So even though the project never got finished, the knowledge that you took from that and the expansion of your artistic ability that came out of that is huge, which itself makes it a success. So that's how you kind of have to recharacterize some of these things where, yes, I didn't finish that movie and I failed to finish the movie, but in making the effort that I made, I've learned so much more. So, and that's kind of what they're getting at here is that failures aren't necessarily failures if you've learned from them. And every time that you fail at something, it's a chance for an education. And that's really what we focus on. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to take a look at success versus failure and do a little bit of comparison there. We'll be right back. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, World Boss Hunts, Star Wars Trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're discussing about the... the Today we're discussing about dealing with failure. We're discussing about failure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so now we're going to talk about success versus failure. If the, uh, if the definition of failure is not achieving a goal, then does meeting a goal equal success? 
To some extent, yes, but that definition feels too confining. Success is psychologically bigger than goal achievement itself. And importantly, it is possible to feel like a successful person even in the face of failure. In our society, we don't tend to acknowledge and appreciate the process of achievements. Instead, we make the feeling of success contingent, contingent upon the outcome. It's important to feel successful. When do you allow yourself to feel successful? If you make success contingent contingent only on achieving out achieving outcome goals you might start to find yourself never feeling good enough instead let's consider an alternative definition of success where we allow ourselves to feel successful for all the efforts we put forth rather than the outcomes success is knowing what you want out of life and feeling proud of yourself for investing in what is meaningful to you Success and failure can be highly subjective. A more open mindset may help you reframe your failure and success. And this is kind of important when we're talking about, especially someone who has a sense of perfectionism. A lot of your perfectionism centers around absolute measures of success. You got that grade. You passed that test. You handed in that assignment and got a grade on it. And a lot of times, that's really not an accurate assessment of success. School's not meant for you to get straight A's. Yeah. School's meant for you to fail at sometimes. Because there's things in life where you, you can't necessarily succeed at. So one of the things that school's supposed to teach you is how to fail. And, and how to fail gracefully and how to survive failing. And if you pass everything that you do with flying colors, you'll never learn that. And then when you're out in the real world and you fail, it could be a crippling experience for you. So one of the things that I do with my guys at work is I I put them in situations where they can't succeed. I'll give them a goal that they can't achieve. And the purpose of that is not to make them fail. It's to see how they handle the failure, how they handle that pressure, how they learn how to work around the obstacles. And it's always a positive experience. There are times in school that I questioned why we were learning things. And uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know who he is? He is an astronomer. He's a very famous scientist. He's on a lot of the documentaries that I watch, and, and, you know, he's on Twitter a lot and stuff. Very smart man. Uh, He hosted the series Cosmos, by the way, the revival of Cosmos. Very good series. He He put a statement out fairly recently, and he talked about math in high school. And kids want to know, why do I have to learn calculus? I'm never going to need to use it in my life. I'm going to go be an artist or or whatever. I'll never need calculus. And what he pointed out was that learning calculus, the ultimate outcome of that exercise was not to know how to do calculus when you were done. It was the exercise of learning differently. Because as you learn different ways of learning, and math is a great example because every type of math out there uses a different part of your brain. As you learn calculus, you're training your brain how to work a different way. And it's that training of your brain that turns on different things in your brain that allows you to deal with situations differently. So you may never know need to know calculus when you get out of high school. But the things that you taught your brain to do when you learn calculus are problem-solving skills you're going to need in real life. And that's what a lot of teenagers and high school students don't realize. Yes, it may be stupid to read. You may think it's stupid to read Romeo and Juliet because it's not a true love story because of various reasons. But in going through and reading the stories and understanding the language and the emotion and the various different things that reading that type of thing brings out, it's unlocking different parts of your brain. 
you're never going to have to probably ever quote Shakespeare again in your life, depending on what you do in college. But the different learning exercises that you go through, you just got a project for this where you have to turn the balcony scene into a text message. Why? What is, what's the purpose of that? It's to show that we understand what the scene is trying to do. Yes, but no. It's how to translate this complex set of emotions that are conveyed in the play into modern time. It's almost an interpretive way of working through emotions that you might not otherwise have the experience to work through. If you're not dating anybody, you're not confronted with these emotions, so you don't you don't feel them, you don't experience them, you don't understand them necessarily. When you go through a play like this, the author, in this case, Shakespeare, teaches you about these emotions through the words, through the phrases, through the actions. So it's about teaching you about much more than just the words in the, in the story. So that's kind of what we, we talk about here in that when you fail, your failure becomes that educational experience where the next time that you have to do that challenge, you might fail, but you might fail for different reasons. You're not going to fail for the same reasons. And it teaches you how to deal with those hardships and those experiences because you're not going to always succeed. As perf perfect as you are in school and as great as your grades are, when you get in the real world, there's going to be obstacles that you can't overcome. You're going to need to be able to be equipped to handle those. Everybody is. And that's why a lot of times when they give you a test that you can't pass, you know, my history teacher, you know, as much as I complained about him when I was in high school, did this. He would give you a test on something you never talked about in school because he expected you to read the book, even though you didn't do it in class. And when I failed those tests, I learned how to learn in his class. And it was tough. It was a, it was a, it was a challenge up front. So the other thing that they do talk about are stages of failure. Over time, you may shift your focus to feeling successful from process outcomes. There's three stages of failure. Failure of vision is when you're not clear about what you want on your person, on your personal why, or your personal why. When you don't know what you want out of life, or if you're not feeling purpose and meaning in your life, then you might have a feeling of failure of vision. This is where looking inward and focusing on your own well-being can make a difference. Failure of tactics. This is when you know what you want, but you don't have a clear or effective plan for achieving it. For instance, maybe you failed to complete a project because you only have a general sketch and not a master plan. Even those who are effective at strategic planning in the workplace sometimes struggle, especially when trans translating those skills into tactics for personal or leadership development. This is where habit tracking and development can be very effective. Failure of strategy is when you have a plan and follow it, but still don't know how to achieve your goal. An endless number of factors could be affecting your success. They may be related or unrelated to your plan. Failure of strategy is an ideal moment to employ your design thinking skills and get working on the next iteration. Understanding why you feel failure can help you overcome challenges to your process outcomes. Perhaps you're simply unfinished. Then thinking through this will result in renewed motivation to achieve your process outcomes. Keep in mind that none of us can avoid failure all the time. That's not the intent. We live in a world where our successes as individuals and teams depend on us learning more and faster to perform better. If we aren't failing, we probably aren't taking enough risks. Too often, we kind of intellectually embrace experimentation and risk-taking. But we want to do it efficiently 
and cleanly without failing. That's not the intent. The intent is to be resilient in the face of failures. A resilient person will use these strengths in service of goal achievement. The first is self-compassion. Show kindness toward yourself and others involved in the failure. Focus on empathy and creating the failure and and keeping the failure in perspective. There's a difference between admitting failure and beating yourself up over it. There's also your cognitive, cognitive, cognitive ang- angu- agility, agility, Con- cognitive, 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 agility, agility. Be willing to quickly learn from failures and pivot to new opportunities. There's also a growth in mindset. Take a learner's approach with a non-judgmental stance. By default, we respond defensively or cast blame. Instead, reflect deeply and try to understand how to be different going forward. There's also problem solving. Stay curious and creative. Collect data to inform decisions and next steps. There's also purpose and meaning. Don't have regrets. Reconnect with the larger meaning behind the goal and use that to drive new approaches. And finally, we have recognition. 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 Appreciate the efforts that you and others have dedicated thus far. Feel successful by weighing the process as much as or more than the outcome. And I think that kind of touches on all the points that I had talked about there. Is that it's a it's a process. You know, failure failure is something that happens, but it's something that we can turn into something that's constructive. And you can't beat yourself up over it. Yeah. We're going to take our last break here. We're going to come back, and we're going to talk about learning from failure. We'll be right back. All right. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking about dealing with failure. And now we're going to talk about learning from failure. So, as we always like to say, failure is a great teacher. It can be a valuable lesson for us in the long run. We should be able to examine it and take important lessons away from it. Performing a failure analysis and looking at the root causes of our failure is a key way of learning from failure. This is partially true if you... Particularly... This is particularly true if you suffer a complex failure, where the reason for failure may not be immediately clear. It's nice to know what we are going, what we are doing in our jobs or business. But failure feedback gives us something equally important, a learning process or teachable moment about what we are doing wrong as well. Often, small failures early on in a project can almost be like an experiment. These failures can create innovation that leads to future success. This is one of the things that I do a lot at work, where I have two different teams that report to me, and it's my job to to point out not just failures, but where they can improve. So a lot of times I look like I'm overly critical. I appear overly critical sometimes to my, my team. And I have one employee who who kind of hits an accurately description on me. And he says, I'm firm but fair. I don't unfairly criticize people. I don't nitpick. But areas that there can be improvement. Like one of the things I try to do is I always try to empower my teams. 
if they have to communicate with the users or with upper management, I prefer that they do it directly. But when they send that communication out, I'll review it and I'll give them pointers if I think there's ways that they could make it better. So the next time they have to do it, they can improve what they do and I'm not micromanaging them. I trust my employees to do the things they, they need to do to, in order to get their jobs done. But I'm there kind of as a, as a teacher to help them tweak things, make things better, think a little bit differently, approach things differently, rephrase things. Uh, when there's a technical problem and people come to me, we just had a, an incident this week where my one team had a server go down on them. And they were kind of disorganized in how they were going about fixing it. And they came to me and they gave me what their proposed solution was. And it was a valid solution. It just wasn't one that would have been top on my priority list. So I kind of talked them through the process of what our priorities are, what we need to do first. Based on what we need to do first, let's figure out what the best solution is to try first. And ultimately, we came up with four different options. Their solution was one of those options, but it was number three on that list. We never had to get to it because number two on my list turned out to be the solution, and we were able to get things back up and running. But it taught them that process of, okay, a server's down. It serves a certain function. How do we fix this? How do we prioritize a solution? They kind of did it, but they didn't do it as effectively or as efficiently as I would have liked them to. Walking them through that process, they now have learned that. Did they fail to do their jobs? Absolutely not. They just learned a better way to do it in the long run. Mm -hmm. So what we do after things like that is we'll perform a failure analysis. And, and there's several different frameworks that you can use for failure analysis. One of the most uh, popular is the FMEA, the Failure Mode and Effects Analysis. Performing a failure analysis allows you to calculate the risk priority number, the RPN, for a process. An RPN is based on the severity, occurrence rate, and detection rate of different challenges that may arise in your business processes. One other thing that we add to our risk analysis is the overall impact. Is it affecting one user? Is it affecting a department? Is it affecting the entire company? Is it production down? Is it mission critical production down, I should say? Is it an inconvenience? So it has to be an impact analysis along with it from our perspective. So to perform a process failure analysis, there's 10 steps that you need to know. The first is to review the process. Brainstorm potential failure modes, the root causes of the problem. List potential effects of each failure. Assign severity rankings, assign occurrence rankings, assign detection rankings. We would then assign our impact analysis ranking. Calculate, calculate the risk priority number, develop an action plan, take action, calculate the resulting RPN, your risk priority number, at that point in time. And then the third thing that we'll do, or the last thing uh, I should say that we would do, is after the problem's fixed, we'll go back and do a deep dive on the process itself, and we'll figure out how what we can do in the future to either prevent that failure or improve the process itself and how we can be more efficient at at solving that problem in the future. And it's not something that we're going to change policies or anything, but that thought experiment itself is that educational feedback loop that we like to be, you know, I like to keep my guys kind of working in all the time. Uh, they say if you want to take a more structured approach to learning from your model, these steps will guide you through the process. So what should we take away from failure? Well, the biggest thing is probably that failure is not inherently bad. On the contrary, most failures provide amazing opportunities to gain new insights about yourself or your work. And some failures even create the opportunity to be triumphant. We are working and living in inc 
in increasingly ambiguous and fast-changing systems. We will all have to get more comfortable with making mistakes and learning to fail better. Learning to fail is a skill we can all practice. And I'll even add to that, to not be afraid to fail. Everyone, If you're afraid to fail, and we talked about it earlier, then you're afraid to take the risks necessary to elevate yourself to the next level. Now, I'm typically a pretty risk-averse person myself, so before I take that risk, I'll generally do a risk-benefit analysis. And that's basically sitting down and figuring out if, if I take this risk, is the benefit going to outweigh the potential for the detriment? And if it is, or if it's a 50-50, I'll probably go with the risk itself. And that's sort of where we came up with those four solutions for that server failure that we had this weekend. What are my risks? Okay, well, my risk is this server is not going to come back up. It's a hardware failure. We're never going to get it back up. We're never going to get a backup of it. And that was really, that was the ter- determining factor in what direction we went because we didn't have it in the backup system. So we had to get it back up in a certain way so that we could then take a backup of it. And then with that backup, we could do different, we had different options. So don't be afraid to fail. Everybody fails. Learn how to fail gracefully. Yeah. That's the important thing. We're going to take a quick break, come back, and get your closing thoughts and shout-outs if you have any. All righty. All right, so the biggest takeaway is that, well, failure is a really great teacher. We've It's honestly been a lesson that we've said in a lot of our podcasts at this point, and we finally dedicated an entire podcast to finally defining it and realizing that it really isn't so black and white as most people would think of it as. Again, we've mentioned how society genuinely thinks that failure is a bad thing and you shouldn't be failing and should always strive for success. However, when you do actually fail, it's normally a learning process, and Everybody's going to fail. It's not impossible to not fail. Um, When you do fail, you should strive to get better. And like we always say, you learn more from your failures than you do your successes. Very good. Sage words as always. And I think that's all we had for today. Uh, Before we do go, I would want to once again uh, invite you to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens. You can find video versions and audio versions of all of our podcasts listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, Buzzsprout, and pretty much any place you can get a podcast. I would also invite you to write in, give us your feedback. We'd love to hear how we're doing. Give us your suggestions for show topics. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can find high-res loop, uh, versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insightsintothings. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insightsintothings. Or you can find links to all that and more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you... And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother, Sam. Well done. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.